Father, um, Father, I just thank you. I thank you for this evening, Lord, a, a chance uh, once again, Lord, uh, you give us multiple chances, Lord, but a chance once again just to get into your word, Father, uh, to seek you, Father. I pray, Lord, that you would anoint it, that you would speak to our hearts, prepare us, Father, for what you have for us tonight, Lord. And just as we go through the, the gospel of Mark, as we go through this chapter, Father, that you would reveal to us uh, something you'd have to share with us tonight, Lord, some treasure, something we could take home and ponder, Lord. Uh, help us just to draw closer to you through it, Lord, and uh, also to be like the Bereans, to search these things out and see whether they're so, Father. So we give you this evening, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. We're teaching in the Gospel of Mark on Thursdays, and if you remember... Mark was very close to Peter. Some even said it was a, a gospel according to Peter, written by Mark. Uh, but in Peter's letters, he calls Mark his son in the faith. See, Peter had played a key role in Mark's growth, and in Mark's gospel here, we see stories that Peter would have had firsthand knowledge of, and of even things left out that Peter didn't want to make a big deal out of, drawing attention to himself and things like that. Like walking on the water, for example. Remember, Mark's gospel is written for a Gentile audience. So he has a target audience. He doesn't get into the Old Testament very much and bring things out. Uh, last week we saw, uh, as we were going through the gospel, Jesus sends his disciples out on the lake after feeding the 5,000. We saw in one of the other gospels in John six fifteen that they wanted to make Jesus king even by force, if possible, after he had fed them with the bread. And Jesus, knowing this, sends the people on their way, and he heads up on top of the mountain to pray. So he sends them off, he sends his disciples out on the lake, and he goes up to a mountain to pray. See, I believe this was around the height of Jesus' earthly ministry. See, the people had heard about Jesus and they needed to make a decision whether they believed Jesus was the Messiah spoken of in God's word or not. See, this uh, trying to take Jesus and make him king, I believe, was an attack of the enemy. It wasn't God's plan at that time to make Jesus king. In John 6, we are told that the next day when they couldn't find Jesus, that they got in their boats and they went looking for him. And when they found Jesus, they asked him when he had arrived there. And Jesus responded in John 6, 26, he said, Most assuredly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw the signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Do not labor for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to everlasting life, which the Son of Man will give you, because God the Father has set his seal on him. So he's kind of going a little more in depth. They're looking for him. They're following after him. And he says, you're not following me because you saw the signs and you realize who I am. You're looking for food. Jesus said, you missed the reason of the miracle. It was a sign declaring to you who I am. Don't strive for these things that perish like bread. You need to seek eternal life that only I can give you. He goes on in 28. He says, then they said to him, what shall we do that we may work the works of God? And Jesus answered and said to them, This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he sent. That's what God wants. They went back and forth for a bit in this chapter with Jesus not understanding what he was telling them and asking for another sign. Show us another miracle. Um, make manna and give it to us. And Jesus tells them again, I am the bread of life. I'm it. John 6, 40, he says, And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up at the last day. He goes on in 53 and says, Then Jesus said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. So as Jesus rises in popularity, the enemy, he steps up his tack against Jesus. And when Jesus spoke these words, many people stopped following him. They couldn't understand. This was, this was too much. 
And Mark picks up the story in chapter 7 and tells us about another attack that came against Jesus. He said some Pharisees who traveled all the way from Jerusalem came to examine Jesus. Now, I like maps. I like kind of knowing where things are. So here's a map for you. Down here is Jerusalem. That's the Dead Sea, just the tip of it. But for this sake, I, I wanted to pull way back out. And way up here is the Sea of Galilee. Now, this area here is Samaria. And we know that Pharisees came to see Jesus. So these Pharisees would have gone out of their way to avoid Samaria over here to the Jordan, traveled up, and then went back across to the Sea of Galilee just so that they could see Jesus. So they're there to examine him. When they arrived after traveling about 120 miles, they see Jesus' disciples eating with unwashed hands. And I pointed out that this had nothing to do with God's word and everything to do with their traditions. See, all the Jews wash their hands in a special way, their cups, their utensils. It has to be special, but the disciples of Jesus, they didn't do that. And the religious bigwigs had found something wrong with Jesus. See, he wasn't making his followers obey the traditions. Well, Jesus had a few words to say to them about their traditions. He calls them hypocrites. And he quotes Isaiah 21, 29, because they had placed their traditions above God's word. And Jesus tells them that these traditions are wrong. For an example, he brought up the commandment to honor your father and mother. See, they had a tradition that said, if you dedicate your wealth to the temple, when you die, you no longer have to take care of your parents, making the word of God of no effect through your traditions, which you have handed down and many such things you do. See, this is where we left off last week, talking about these traditions that these Pharisees were trying to honor above God's word. So we're going to pick it up in Mark chapter 7, verse 14. He says, When he had called all the multitude to himself, he said to them, Hear me, everyone, and understand. There is nothing that enters a man from outside which can defile him, but the things which come out of him, those are the things that defile a man. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, Jesus is still talking to these Pharisees about their traditions when he starts, I don't know, maybe yelling to the crowd to gather closer. Come in, come in. I have something I want to say. Hear me. He says, there is nothing that enters a man from outside that defiles him. See, Jesus is still talking about food. The things you eat will not defile you, but the waste that comes out will, he says. Now, Matthew 15, because Mark is kind of short and concise and to the point and only picks out a few things just to get his point across, Matthew brings out a little bit more and he says, not what goes into the mouth defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth, this defiles a man. See, it's not whether you eat with unwashed hands or unwashed cups or bowls. The spiritual aspect of this is that those things that come from your heart, your mind, those are the things that will defile you. Now, 1 Samuel 16 plays into this or, or goes along with this. It said, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have refused him. He's looking for a king. He says, for the Lord does not see as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance but the Lord looks at the heart. Now, it's not that our thoughts and things come from our heart. Uh, we would say they come from our mind, but those intentions, the things that come from within us. He says, if anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Listen up, because Jesus is revealing God's heart in this matter. And Paul will say to the Gentile believers, every creature of God is good. And nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving. See, Jesus just did away with the Jewish dietary laws. Now, there's going to be a little gap in between here because the law isn't done away with yet because Jesus hasn't died for our sins and done away with the law. But uh, he's telling them that it's going to be done away with. The point is your spiritual cleanliness before the Lord. Are you doing it because you're trying to be good and follow a certain set of rules or because you love the Lord and you want to obey him. Matthew 5:17 says, "Do not think that I came to destroy the law or the prophets. 
I did not come to destroy the law, but to fulfill it. See, through Jesus and his death and resurrection, the requirement of the law has been done away with. While he's saying these things, it hasn't, but now they have. Galatians 3, 24 through 25 says, Therefore the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ, that we might be justified by faith. But after, after faith has come, we are no longer under a tutor. See, this would have been very difficult for a Pharisee and all the Jews to receive because they had lived their lives trying to cleanse the outside of the cup. Everyone who looked at them considered them to be righteous. Jesus said in Matthew 5.20, For I say to you that unless your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you will by no means enter the kingdom, kingdom of heaven. Well, then how can someone be better than these Pharisees? Just look at them. Look how good they look. You know, they're always walking around throwing ashes on their head. And, you know, who can be more righteous than a Pharisee? Everyone can see that. But this was their outward appearance and not what was really going on. Philippians 3, 6 through 7 says, Concerning zeal, speaking of Paul when he was a Pharisee, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, I was blameless. But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Paul, who was a Pharisee, lived this life. And he said, when it came to the law, I was blameless. But we know that the law is much deeper than our outward uh, actions. Verse 17, he picks it up. He says, when he had entered a house away from the crowd, his disciples asked him concerning the parable. Now, this verse is important for us to remember because the disciples asked Jesus when they were alone about the parable. So we can't put too much stock into the parable. We have to put stock into what Jesus, uh, the interpretation of the parable and what it was pointing to. It was about the Pharisees and the crowds. A parable is a story that's laid beside a truth. The emphasis is not on the parable, but on the spiritual principle that Jesus is teaching. Now, you can read this and think, well, what about touching blood? That defiles a person. And what about touching the dead and other laws that were handed out concerning things that make you unclean? Is Jesus doing away with all of those too? See, we need to not add more to God's word and what is being said. He's just referring to eating food at this point with a parable. And he says, and what goes into a person doesn't defile him, but what comes out of a person. Jesus says, that's what defiles him. It's what comes out of a man's heart that's going to judge him, that's going to defile him. He goes on in 18 and he says, So he said to them, Are you thus without understanding also? Do you not perceive that whatever enters a man from outside cannot defile him? Because it does not enter his heart, but his stomach, and is eliminated, thus purifying all foods. Being clean and unclean before God is not about how dirty our skin is or what things we've put in our mouths. It's about our thoughts, those things in our hearts that defile us. See, our heart and our mind are defiled by sin. That is not to say that everything going into you is good. You may want to get drunk, but again, where's that thought coming from? It's not that you can't put alcohol on your lips, but when you go to excess, the Bible tells us that that's a sin. James 1, 14 through 15 says, But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it's full grown, brings forth death. So it's what comes out of us. He goes on and he said, What comes out of a man, that defiles a man. For from within, out of the heart of men, proceeds evil thoughts, adulteries, fornication, murder, thefts, covetousness, deceit, lewdness, an evil eye, blasphemy, pride, foolishness. All these things come from within and defile a man. See, these sinful things that Mark lists for all of us begin in our hearts, just like James had said. And according to this, and other scriptures, by what we've just read, we're all defiled. We're all unclean. 
See, there's not at least one thing on this list that we haven't done. See, if we are all defiled, then what's the solution? If every one of our hearts is defiled and cannot please God, then what hope do we have? Well, in ourselves, the tragic news is none. But God did not leave us to do it on our own. I have a verse in here I liked. It's in Ezekiel 36. It says, Then I will sprinkle clean water on you, and, I, and you shall be clean. I will cleanse you from all your filthiness and from your idols. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit within you. I will take a heart of stone out of your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them. See, God is in the business of giving his people new hearts, and it's his work. See, we're told he will also give us not only a new heart, but his spirit. Titus 3.5 says, He saved us not because of the righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. He washed away our sins, giving us a new birth and new life through the Holy Spirit. See, we received this new nature when we believed in Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Through Jesus, we are all spiritually cleansed. We are all made new. It's all because of his work. Just like that verse in Ezekiel, I will do it. I will cleanse you. I will make you new. I will give you a heart of flesh. When we come to Jesus and ask him to be our Lord and Savior, he does that work in our lives. He gives us his nature. Verse 24 says, From there he arose, and he went to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And he entered a house, and he wanted no one to know it, but he could not be hidden. Now again, I have a map to give you an idea of just where Jesus headed off to. Now, same map kind of, except this time the Sea of Galilee is down here. And right about where that pointer is, is Capernaum where kind of his base station, and he's going to head up out of the Sea of Galilee up here to Tyre, and then eventually up to Sidon. So this is kind of where he's at, and it looks like it's out of the land of Israel right now. He's getting up there in the north. Uh, but during the time of Jesus, Israel was ran by the Romans. So you have different people over different areas, but there was no real nation of Israel, so to speak, because they're ran by all these other leaders. You've got this Herod over there, Herod, uh, Caesar Philippa. You know, you've got these different, these different people leading different areas. So Jesus heads out of the area that we know as Israel, and he goes north to the area, we would call it Lebanon, but uh, in his time it was called Phoenicia. So he's up there in that area, north, northwest, and Jesus goes to two port cities, Tyre and Sidon, where he hopes to get away from it all. And it says he wanted no one to know. Now, I was thinking about this, and I guess I always thought that Jesus did all of his ministries in Israel. But Jesus has gone to a very Gentile area, a very busy place, with lots of people traveling from one area to the next, and he's going to do a ministry up there. See, Jesus wanted to get away from the crowds that chased after him for the miracles he did. Everyone wanting to touch him. But you know, this would be a great area to spread the good news. It would be a great area to tell people about himself and just who he is. But that is not why Jesus is there. And I was thinking about this. And you know, there's those times where you just want to get away from it all and relax. We might call it a vacation. But you just want to take it easy, hide out. Well, so did Jesus. He felt the same things we do. Remember, he was trying to get away last week. But he couldn't hide. He goes all the way up north. See, word had got around that someone named Jesus was there. And this woman who needed help that nobody else was able to give had heard about it. Now, the news about this man and the fact that he was in her town would have given her hope, I would suspect. Something maybe she had lost. And people in this area had already known who Jesus was. It's not like they were, it was, uh, he's a an out-of-towner that everybody's curious about. Because Mark chapter 3, verse 7 said, But Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea, and a great multitude from Galilee followed him, and from Judea and Jerusalem and Udamea and beyond the Jordan, and those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, 
when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. See, it would have been difficult for 13 people to walk into town and not be noticed. It says, For a woman whose young daughter had an unclean spirit heard about him, and she came and fell at his feet. See, this woman, she has a little girl, and this little girl was possessed by an evil spirit. And when she heard about Jesus, she comes and she falls down at his feet. And I think, well, Mary wept at the feet of Jesus. The other Mary sat at the feet of Jesus. And we see a Gentile woman doing the same thing. And when your child is sick or hurt, I think it can consume you, especially for a mother. I think about your kids, you know, when they go through something major, what would you do for the help of a man who all the people have ever had to do was just reach out and touch him and they're healed? What would you do? This woman was a Greek, a Syrophoenician by birth, and she kept asking to cast the demon out of her daughter. Well, it says that she's a Greek. She probably spoke Greek and she worshiped the Greek gods in the area of Phoenicia. And we're told that she's asking over and over again that Jesus would heal her. Now, we need to come to the Lord the same way, believing and asking him for help like this woman, I believe, who comes expecting, asking, pleading. Matthew tells us a little more detail about the story. He says, Then Jesus went out from there and departed to the region of Tyre and Sidon. And behold, a woman of Canaan came from that region and cried out to him, saying, Have mercy on me, O Lord, son of David. My daughter is severely demon-possessed. So she's coming to Jesus asking. She calls him Lord and Master and even addresses him as the son of David. Makes you wonder what her background is because she either knows some of the prophecy declaring who Jesus is or she's repeating what she's heard about him in hopes of getting help for her daughter. Matthew goes on and says, But he answered her not a word. And his disciples came and urged him, saying, Send her away, for she cries out after us. See, her hope is that Jesus will take pity on her and heal her child, but Jesus won't even speak to her. She isn't giving up, though. She keeps asking. See, something is going to happen. She's going to keep at it, and they're either going to push her away or someone's going to speak to her. And the disciples are quick to ask Jesus to send people away. Send away this woman. She's bugging us, they say. But as I'm going through this, I'm thinking, we have to be very careful when interpreting God's word because we don't know what they were thinking. I thought the disciples wanted her to just go, but maybe they want Jesus to heal her already so she'll just go away on her own. I don't know. But Jesus said to her, let the children be filled first. For it is not good to take the children's bread and throw it to the little dogs. And Matthew said, but he answered and said, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. I'm not sent to you. I'm sent to the lost sheep of Israel. Now Jesus in a roundabout way says no. This doesn't seem like Jesus because everyone who touches him gets healed. Everyone who's ever asked has had a miracle. Even those who don't ask get a miracle. Here is someone falling at his feet, begging him for help. And he says, no. Now he uses the term dog here in Mark. And the Jews use that term to refer to Gentiles in a negative light. Because dogs or Gentiles were unclean. They're without God and they're spiritually dead. See, there is another term though for dog. And that is the word Jesus uses. It means little dog or puppy. It isn't in the negative way that it could be used. See, the children he speaks of are the people of Israel. The bread is the gospel, the word of God. And the children of Israel are the ones this bread is meant for first. Because he said, let the children be filled first. See, they are the ones that he is going to with the bread of life. They are the ones he's ministering to first. And Jesus' response to this lady didn't didn't come because of the woman's constant questioning, constant asking, constant hounding. It came because of his disciples' request to send her away. 
Now, Jesus uses this, I believe, as a lesson. This is a pattern that we see over and over again. See, Jesus ordered his disciples to go in pairs and preach the gospel to the Jews and work miracles among them. He said not to go in the way of the Gentiles, not into any of the cities of the Samaritans. But when they had gone through the cities of Judea, he ordered them after his resurrection to go into all the world and to preach the gospel to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. See, Paul had always shared with the Jews in whatever city he was in, and when they rejected it, he would then turn and go to the Gentiles. Romans 1.16 says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first, and also for the Greek or the Gentile. Now, though it gives preference to the Jew, it does not exclude the Gentile. Now, I started off sharing tonight some verses in John where Jesus declared who he was. But when he did that, a lot of them turned away. And this took place, it seems, after that account where he goes off to Tyre and Sidon and he sees this woman. A lot of those people had rejected Jesus, but yet here he is with the Gentile woman. And it's not the first Gentile that he's dealt with. See, Peter was told not to call unclean what God has cleansed, and then he was sent to the Gentiles. Even though at first glance it looks like Jesus is ignoring this woman, calling her a dog and telling her no, that is not the Jesus we all love, and that's not what he's saying. And she answered and said to him, Yes, Lord, yet even the little dogs under the table eat from the children's crumbs. Now Matthew tells us that first this woman worshipped Jesus and then asked for the crumbs that fall. And I don't think this woman would have stopped, even if Jesus had said no. See, this is her lifeline. She understands Jesus has his eyes on Israel, but she will settle for crumbs. She'll settle for the leftovers. I think this is a great story. And as I was going through this, I was thinking about myself. Jesus, is he my lifeline? Is he your lifeline? Are you spending your time seeking him over and over in prayer? Are you at his feet worshiping him? Because the opposite is true. If you let yourselves grow comfortable, if you let yourselves grow stagnant and lukewarm, he says, I'd rather spit you out of my mouth because I want you to be hot or cold. You know, we need Jesus as much today as we ever have. It's not that we have it all worked out now. We still need him for every aspect of our lives. Then he said to her, For this saying, go your way. The demon has gone out of your daughter. Now Jesus tells her, O woman, great is your faith. Let it be to you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. And when she had come to her house, she found the demon gone out and her daughter lying on the bed. And again, departing from the region of Tyre and Sidon, he came through the midst of the region of Decapolis to the Sea of Galilee. Now last map. It says that he left the area of Tyre. Now, this is about, I believe it's about 60 miles up here to Tyre, 50 or 60 miles, I don't remember. Uh, I leaked since about an hour ago, and I think it's about another 20 miles to go up here. So if you look at different translations, uh, the King James doesn't say it, the New King James, the uh, New Living, the uh, Bible in Basic English, the ESV, the NIV, some of these other translations will say that he left uh, Tyre and he went through Sidon before he heads on back down. So that means he's probably over here in this area with the woman and then he goes up north even further away and then he heads back across and he comes back down. He's skipping Capernaum and all the areas of the Jews. He comes down here is where Decapolis is and he comes back up here to the Sea of Galilee. This is about where he's at, somewhere in, on the shore over there. So he, he's, he's, he's spending some time. He's not going too quick. So Jesus leaves to the northwest, taking time to rest and revealing himself to only one woman up there that we know of before heading back. And now he doesn't take a direct route back to his hometown, but he kind of cruises around the Sea of Galilee all the way back down through Decapolis, says he goes through the middle of it, uh, through the midst of it, and we don't know of anything that Jesus did on his trip just that he arrives back at the Sea of Galilee. Now, this trip could have taken a few months. doesn't seem like he was too, too quick. 
And all that time Jesus had with his disciples, just training them, teaching them. He was going to send them out, right? So he needs some of that personal quality time with these guys just to answer their questions and to teach them. And we're told if all the things that Jesus did and said were written in a book, the world couldn't hold all the volumes. So Jesus could have done many other miracles. We just don't know. But I think he probably did. Now, if you remember in Mark 5, Jesus cast out many demons out of a man and they went into the pigs. Well, that man Jesus told to go and share what was done for him. So the man started off to visit the 10 towns of that region, which is this area of Decapolis. And he began to tell everyone about the great things Jesus had done for him. And they were awestruck by the story. See, it was not a Jewish area that Jesus was in the middle of. And Matthew tells us that after going through the middle of Decapolis, he then winds up on the mountainside where he sat down by the Sea of Galilee. So he's kind of cruising through a Gentile area. You know, the story about how this man got healed and the demons cast out, they went into the pigs, had spread. It says, then they brought to him one who was deaf and had an impediment in his speech. And they begged him to put his hand on him. Jesus, like the other times, when Jesus arrives in the area, the people had recognized him and they immediately bring someone that needs to be healed. Now Jesus was going through the Gentile cities and this would have been a, a largely Gentile crowd that had been following Jesus from Decapolis. And again, looking at Matthew, it says, Then great multitudes came to him having with them the lame, the blind, the mute, the maimed, and many others. And they laid them down at Jesus' feet and he healed them again. At Jesus' feet. So the multitude marveled when they saw the mute speaking, the maimed made whole, and the lame walking, and the blind seeing, and they glorified the God of Israel for the miracles, the glorifying Him for the healings. Now, this account also gives us an idea that they are Gentiles because after the miracle, they glorified not God, they glorified the God of Israel. Now, Mark points out one main healing. He said they brought someone who couldn't speak or hear. But Jesus heals this man differently than the others. Verse 33 says, And he took him aside from the multitude, and he put his finger in his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then he looked up to heaven, he sighed, and he said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. Now, if you can't hear anything that Jesus said to you, you wouldn't understand what he was talking about unless you could read lips. So if you think about this man and he can't hear, you have to think about what does he see? What is this guy seeing going on? Well, he sees that Jesus takes him aside. Something is personal. Something between him and me. Something, something between us. Then he puts his fingers in both of his ears. I don't know. Maybe Jesus knows that I can't hear and he's doing something with my ears, sticking his fingers in there. It's kind of personal. Then Jesus spits and then touched his tongue. What could that mean? I don't know what that means. Perhaps Jesus knows there's uh, something wrong with my speech. I hope this is good. And then Jesus looks up to heaven. I don't know. Is he talking to God? Is he praying? What's he doing? His chest it collapses like a big sigh. Is that hurt? Does Jesus hurt for me? Is that a sigh? Is this hard for him? See, this word for sigh also is translated prayer or pray at other times in the Bible. A prayer without words. Is he groaning? Is he praying? He's looking up. And then Jesus speaks. Oh, I wish I knew what this man was about to say. But that's when the first words maybe he has ever heard came from the lips of Jesus. See, immediately his ears were opened and the impediment of his tongue was loosed and he spoke plainly. See, Jesus putting his fingers into his ears may have given him hope. Jesus would heal him. But then when he speaks, not only was this man able to hear things he never heard, he understood what was said after never being able to speak. This man spoke a language he may never have heard. He spoke plainly without difficulty, easy for everyone to understand. The first word he ever heard, Ephatha. It's a rare word, only used here in the Bible in this verse. 
He goes on and it says, then he commanded them that they should tell no one. But the more he commanded them, the more widely they proclaimed it. See, this is a a difficulty. Uh, The man hasn't been able to speak. And now that he's healed, Jesus tells him not to speak. See, this is one of the greatest things that's happened to him. And people will want to know. But nowhere is the news about Jesus being the Son of God here spoken. Nothing saying that he's come to take away the sins of the world. Just a healing, just a miracle. See, the the only thing this man knows is that this guy is a miracle worker. He's healed me. I can now see or I can hear, I can speak, I'm made whole. He's a miracle worker. But one day in the future, they will all know. It says, and they were astonished beyond measure, saying he has done all things well. He makes both the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. See, in this miracle, Jesus has done the impossible for his physical body. But we know that he's also going to do the impossible for their spiritual bodies giving them eternal life through him. That's going to be the bigger story, the greatest thing that will ever happen to this man because it's the greatest thing that has ever happened to us, all because of his son. You know, we see healings and want to be a part of it, but the greatest miracle has already happened in our own hearts because he's taken people that were lost in sin, destined to spend an eternity without him, and given us a future and a hope and promises, promises of an inheritance with him. What greater blessing could we have than that? And on top of that, he says, blessed are those who believe and don't see. An extra blessing. Measured, smash down, make room for more, because he loves us that much. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this evening, Lord. What, a, what an amazing story with the lady and her child and this man who can't, can't speak and can't hear, Father, just how much you loved them, Father, how much you love us, Lord. But, Father, it's not about the miracles. It's not about the amazing things that you've done, Father, but it's about who you are, Lord. Just the amazing uh, life you've given to us so that we could spend an eternity with you, Father. We thank you for that, Father, even though we only grasp the tip of it, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would help us to hold on to that lifeline, Lord, not to let go thinking we have it under control, Father, but to constantly, to always keep you before our eyes, Lord, following after you as closely as possible, Lord, so that we won't wander, Lord. We pray, Father, that you would just guide and direct our paths, Father. Continue to help us to meditate on your word, to draw closer to you through it, Father. And I pray, Lord, that you'd help us to bring you glory and honor in some special way, Father. We thank you for this evening. In Jesus' name, amen.